Discussing today's topics from an African-American perspective, this is Another View. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Another View. I'm Another View producer, Lisa Godley, filling in for Barbara Ham Lee. You are going to be so glad you tuned into today's Another View. In just a few moments, you will see why Forbes magazine named Dr. George Frazier's Power Networking Conference one of the top five conferences not to be missed in America. But before we jump into this engaging conversation, let's find out what's happening with Winter Storm Jonas. Joining me on the phone is Weather Channel meteorologist Terry Smith. Terry, what can we expect? Well, hey there, Lisa. Um, it is uh, quite a messy situation because not everybody's going to get the same thing and as our temperatures are fluctuating right at or just above freezing uh, this morning and into the afternoon. It's kind of a mixture of rain and light snow and even sleet at times. But uh, the good news is with this storm, if you want to call it good news, it's drawing in some uh, warmer air, and so our temperatures will stay above freezing overnight and then through much of the day tomorrow. So at some point, this is going to change all over to rain. So any snow amounts that we get generally will be on the light side, and we may see maybe one or two inches of snow in some of the counties uh, far to the north and over to the west, say, around Wakefield and Williamsburg, for instance, but lighter snow amounts here in the, the local area. Okay, and folks traveling... What can they expect if they're traveling toward the um, the Richmond, D.C. area? Um, I don't know that they'd want to travel toward the Richmond, D.C. area, frankly. Um, with the amount of snow that is uh, anticipated in the region, uh, the roads are going to be a bit difficult. There are um, blizzard warnings up towards Fredericksburg. There are winter storm warnings. Uh, for a large part of the state of Virginia, up toward Richmond and up toward D.C., for instance. So um, I certainly would not advise getting on the roads. Um, and a lot of the airports are closing down preemptively, canceling flights at least for tomorrow. I don't know what the status is today. Um, so it's not a good situation for doing any sort of long-distance traveling either. Okay. Any other advice before we let you go? Well, the the main concern for us or the main problem is likely to be the winds as the storm gets closer. Uh, we have a high wind watch right now, which means the National Weather Service is anticipating the winds to uh, be more of an issue starting tonight and through the day tomorrow and, and into the early hours on Sunday. And, and we're looking at uh, 20 to 30 to 40 mile an hour winds and even gustier winds than that. So with the wet weather and the winds, there could be some power outages just uh, because of power lines coming down in the wind. Wow. Okay. Terry, Terry Smith from the Weather Channel, thank you so much you bet. For, for helping us out this morning. We appreciate it. Well, it's been two decades since Black Enterprise Magazine dubbed Dr. George Frazier the new voice for African Americans. He is the founder of the world's largest black networking organization, FraserNet. He has written six best-selling books, produced an award-winning power networking conference that Forbes magazine names one of the top five conferences not to be missed in America. And as an inspirational speaker, he has shared his words of wisdom over 2,000 times. And I am so glad that Dr. Frazier is joining us to share some of his thoughts with our Another View audience. Dr. Frazier, welcome to Another View. Thank you so much. It's good to hear your voice, and thank you for all the great work that you're doing. You are community drum, and we deeply appreciate you for that, and uh, uh, I'm looking forward to our conversation. Well, I, you know, I want to share something. I remember the first time I heard you speak, Barbara and I were sitting in one of our Tuesday morning editorial meetings, and she said to me, Lisa, you have got to hear this guy. And I said, oh, okay. So we were supposed to be listening for a few minutes, but you were so engaging. We listened, we listened to the entire thing. And one of the Ooh. things you kept repeating over and over again was, I'm not going to tell you anything you haven't heard before, but it's just the way you say it. So That's I'm, right. <laughs> I'm going to start with this question. Um, for the listeners who have never heard you or are thinking, okay, who is this guy? He probably can't relate to the struggle, um, born with a silver spoon in his mouth, had two college-educated parents. So I want you to start with sharing your story regarding your upbringing. Uh, yeah, I was born with a, uh, uh, a silver spoon in my mouth, but it was rusted. And uh, um, uh, I'm one of 11 children. 
my father came to this country in the early 1900s from Guyana, beautiful black man, married a fair-skinned sister, Ida Mae Baldwin, uh, from Lumpkin, Georgia, and they moved to Brooklyn, New York, in Bed-Stuy, and there were 11 of us, eight boys and three girls. When I turned three years old, I'm the youngest. Uh, my mother became mentally ill and was institutionalized for the balance of her life. My father, a New York City cab driver, couldn't get a good education and get a good job in the early 1900s in America as a black man. So he was relegated to driving a New York City cab, and he had to work 12 to 14 hours a day and could not take care of 11 children. So at three years old, I was orphaned. I stayed in an orphanage from three to five, and because nobody would take 11 children, we were broken up into threes and put into foster homes. So I spent the balance of my young life until I aged out at 18, that's when you age out of foster care, uh, certainly in New York and I think around the country. Um, and uh, fortunately, uh, my father maintained his brownstone that he owned in Brooklyn, in Bed-Stuy, and I had a place to go back to, but uh, my heart goes out to those children in foster care because so many foster care children uh, do not have a place to go back to. And this is why 30, 35 percent of foster children end up homeless. And, um, I, you know, I, my foster parents could not afford to send me to college. So uh, my first job, once graduating with a vocational diploma in woodworking, because no one thought I was college material. So I was relegated to a vocation. Um, uh, and I, my first job was uh, mopping floors on the midnight shift at LaGuardia Airport and paying my way as best as I could through college. Although I did not complete college, I basically had to work uh, to survive. And, uh, you know, that's the story of my life. And, you know, as the old saying goes, it's not how you start, it's how you finish. Oh, and, uh, and I tell this to yeah, and I tell and I tell this to young people all the time when I speak in inner city and in urban schools. You know, I, I say and you know I don't know, you know your your state. I, I don't know you know what what's going on in your life. I don't know how you're living. I don't know if you're living with your mother, if you're living with your father, if you're living. I, I don't know what what your, the state of your being is at this moment in time. Here's what I do know: is that this this is the hand that God has dealt you. These are the cards that you have to play. And when you play these cards, God will give you new cards. And and if you just continue to play the cards that you have, all that is due you will come to you. And I really and deeply believe that, that uh, the potential to excel, the potential to be, the potential to do, the potential to contribute, the potential to find God's purpose for you— is inside of you, and uh, it, it is a matter of, of attitude. And, and and certainly it's a matter of circumstances, it's a matter of the people around you, it's a matter of your, your mentoring. But, um, but, but, but the path, the path to success uh, uh, is, is there for everyone, or you just simply would not be born. I think God has put each of us here with a unique purpose in mind as a job that he's assigned each of us to do. And if we do not do it, it will not get done in the universe. And, and for some reason, at least I deeply believed that. I don't know how I believe that, I, I, but I deeply believe that. And I, I, I believe that every job that I have, even mopping floors on the midnight ship at LaGuardia Airport, was there for me for a purpose. So I took ownership. And I was the best floor mopper. I won awards, believe it or not. I won awards for mopping floors at LaGuardia Airport because I took ownership of those floors. They were my floors. And I, as, for as long as I was going to be there, and it was just a couple of years, um, I they were going to be the best-looking floors in, the, in LaGuardia Airport. And that attitude towards every job that I had followed me throughout my life. And it led me to the path in which I am now on and uh, at 70 years old. And uh, I'm grateful. And I wouldn't trade my background. I wouldn't trade my circumstances, my situations, good, bad, or ugly, for anything in the world. Why? Because if, I believe that if, if I did trade them, you and I would not be having this conversation. Right. Now, when we spoke earlier this week, you shared with me that you felt that Dr. King 
would do, what he would do or what he would say if he came back today. Please share your thoughts with our audience. Yeah. um, I have crisscrossed this country and have spent 40 years of my life in service of the African-American communities, being a student of our people, 2,000 speeches, six best-selling books, uh, a successful business, a successful career in the public and private sector. And um, uh, and I, and I, and I want to say this and still be loved <clears throat> by those brothers and sisters who might be listening to me, but I deeply believe, based on my observations, my studying, and my work in the community, that if Dr. King would have come back here 50, nearly 50 years after his death, he would basically pimp slap black people. Um, he would say to us, is this what I took a bullet for, that we are at the bottom of every single statistic that matters in America. And um, we ought to be ashamed of ourselves, and we must fix that. We, uh, baby boomers, uh, there was an interesting article on the front page of USA Today not long ago about baby boomers and their money. And fortunately, it was below the fold. And what it said is that uh, African-American baby boomers will be the first generation of Africans in America to raise another generation of Africans in America that will not do better than them. So in the 400-year history of our people in this great country, we are the only generation to raise another generation that will be worse off. Our ancestors and forefathers must be rolling over in their graves. So the question then becomes, why is this? Why is this? Why, Why are we not better off. And and certainly we have made progress. We are not in chains. Uh, We have overcome uh, Jim Crow. Uh, We have uh, secured our civil rights, our voting rights, and our public access. What is it? And I, I simply say, if the fish stinks, look to the head. It's leadership. It's leadership. And I think the African-American community has been void of the right kind of leadership since Dr. King died, nearly 50 years ago, since Malcolm X died. And we have lost our way and our sense of consciousness. You see, I grew up, I was born in 1945, so I grew up in the 50s and 60s. I grew up with Dr. King in one ear and Malcolm X in the other ear and Smokey Robinson writing the lyrics for my music instead of Little Wayne. Have you ever compared the lyrics of Smokey Robinson to Little Wayne? There is no comparison. I grew up when Gil Scott Heron was singing The Revolution Would Not Be Televised, when Stokely Carmichael, for the first time in the history of Africans in America, put the word black and power together, when James Brown wrote the classic, iconic anthem, Say It Loud, I'm Black and I'm Proud. We were wearing dashikis. We were were wearing afros. There was a consciousness among black folk in America, and I really believe it was because of the level and the consciousness kind of leadership that was supplied by a Dr. King and by a Malcolm X, and we have been missing that. Um, I think in the last uh, two generations, if not three generations. And I think as a result, we have backslided and we have slipped into a state of being that only we can fix. And and, and and again, I want to say this and still be loved. Uh, White people are not going to save black people. They've had 400 years. Um, The only people that are going to save black people are black people. Now, there are some awesomely good white folk out here. I'm not condemning all white people, okay, who absolutely, who are liberal and want to do anything and everything they can to to level the playing field. Um, But that's our secondary strategy. Our primary strategy is what we are doing. And um, and I believe, and, I, and, I've, and I've said this many times in the many talks I've given around the country, that our state reminds me of the boiling frog syndrome. And this is science. This is not just some analogy or metaphor. But the science tells us that if you take a frog and you put it in, the, in a pot of boiling water, the frog will immediately jump out. But if you take that same frog and put it in a pot of cool water and slowly and incrementally turn up the heat, 
the frog's body and biology will adjust to the heat so eventually it will sit there and you can boil it to death. Well, I think that is metaphorically <laughs> the state of black America. And so we have to instill in our young people, because now we have to save our children. We have to save our children, because everything we do, we do for our children. We have to instill in our children, and this will take generations, a new mindset and a new consciousness, a new kind of consciousness. And I've articulated and written about this consciousness that I believe that we must infuse and invest and model, because I believe that we must model the behavior that we expect from our children. So, uh, and, you know, if you want me to go on, I can, I can articulate those consciousness for you. Uh, and then there are a couple of habits that we have to fix. Uh, I, I believe that, that there, we, we have a couple of very, very bad habits. Yeah, could you share about, the, the habits? Let's, let's start with the habits. <laughs> well, there is one particular habit. There are a couple. But there, one, there's one particular habit you say, that is totally unique to black people. No other culture of people do this but us, and it's extremely damaging. What is that habit? A.C. Nielsen came out with a major study a year or so ago on the viewing habits of America. And it stated that African Americans watch... 72 hours of television a week. That's 10 hours of television a day. Now, any Negro watching 10 hours of television a day needs their behind kick. We are simply waiting for you to die, because if you're watching 10 hours of television a day, working eight hours a day and sleeping the rest, you are about nothing, right? You ain't going to do nothing. You're not going to be about anything. And, 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 and so this is something that we, this is a very bad habit. Ten hours of television a day, your life is worthless, right? You make no contribution to our people. You can't. You're watching TV. Now, there's some good stuff on television. There's PBS on television. I watch PBS. I watch <laughs> Charlie Rose. I watch Taz and Smiley. Right. I watch the news. I want to I want to be up on the news and I want to be up on my politics. But other than that, the couple of hours I may spend catching up with the world, that's it. Every now and then I might watch a movie, but that's it. Right. The rest of my life is spent reading and working and investing in my craft and improving my skills and making my business better and becoming so good at what I do that it's impossible to ignore me. I had a, a person ask me a question the other day. Uh, Dr. Fraser, she, she was starting a business, and she said she was very concerned about the support that she was getting from the black community. I said, my dear, support is secondary. The primary thing you should be concerned about is how good are you at delivering your products and services? Are you amazing at doing it? Do you know everything you can know possibly about your niche or micro niche or your business or, uh, or, 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 the, or, or the professional skills necessary to perform your career tasks? And if you are so good, that it's impossible to ignore you. If you are excellent, if you are amazing at whatever it is that you do, you will never have to worry about support. You have to worry about support when you're average, when you're mediocre. Because when you're average or mediocre, you're competing with most of America, plus most of Americans are average to mediocre, so that's where all the competition is. If you are amazing or excellent at what you do, you never have to worry about competition. You will never have to wait in anybody's line. People will wait in line for you. So focus on your skills. Focus on building the best business that it's impossible for people to ignore you. And so I think that there are many in our community that have outstanding careers. We read about them all the time. Uh, and outstanding businesses. Look at the BE 100, right? The Black Enterprise 100, and, and, and there are others. 
but too many of us are performing at an average to mediocre level, right? Now, we can say the same for other cultures, but I'm not concerned about that, right? There sh they should be concerned about that. I'm concerned about where we are and what we are doing and how we are going to overcome uh, you know, uh, very, very oppressive conditions. Because if you're black and mediocre in America, you better leave because you're going to be marginalized in this country and you will ultimately be destroyed. So we have to be better. Now, I'm just repeating what my mama and my daddy taught me 50 years ago. They said to me, you're going to have Georgie Boy. That's what they used to call me. Georgie Boy, you're going to have to be twice as good to get half as much. They were right then and they're still right. So it's not fair. It's not right. We can apply all the isms to this concept that we want to, but it's reality. And so we have to man up and woman up and sharpen our saw and, 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 and get every educational credential that we can stand, right? Uh, and then perform at the highest levels just to make the playing field level. And at some point in time, Later, rather than sooner, things will change. But I think for us to get where we need to get, um, for us to infuse the consciousness and to change the habit, to change actually the three habits, the three habits I want, 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 want black folk to adapt. But it's going to take a generation or two. One, an insatiable appetite for personal growth and development driven by the need for constant, never-ending improvement, lifelong learning. And this is actualized by greater knowledge of self, less entertainment, more study, and more reading. Right? That's habit number one. Habit number two, a burning desire to be obedient obedient to seeking the answer to this question, Lisa. What does God want from me instead of what do I want from life? And then the personal discipline to do the work, to pay the price, and to stay the course. What are we missing? We're missing obedience and discipline in the context of our community. So we need to develop a habit that gives us a burning desire to be obedient and seeking the right answers. And then the third and final habit that I preach and teach and evangelize is an aggressive, never-ending personal and group focus on equity and ownership instead of consumerism and consumption actualized through strategic alliances, joint ventures, partnerships, and collaboration. While cooperation is important, collaboration is more important. When you collaborate instead of cooperate, you see, when you cooperate, one and one makes two. When you collaborate, one and one makes 11. So I've been preaching the gospel of relationship building, networking, leveraging more effectively our collective resources and intellectual capital. Because I deeply believe that God has given black people every single thing they need to succeed. We have everything we need to succeed except each other. Jews have each other, Asians have each other, East Indians have each other, Arabs have each other. We don't have each other. We have a $1.2 trillion annual economy. If we were a nation, we'd be the 16th richest nation in the entire world. There are no black people in the entire world wealthier than black folk in America. But our money goes in one direction, away from us, and we're some of America's most conspicuous consumers. I want to get we have to... brain power. Yeah, now, now I can go on and on and on, but, but I'm sorry. I want to get to that. I just, if you're just joining us, you're talking to best-selling author, inspirational speaker, and the founder of the world's largest black networking organization, FraserNet, Dr. George Frazier. If you have any questions for Dr. Frazier, give us a call at 440-2665 or 1-800-940-2240. I'm going to go back to what you were just talking about because I have heard you say uh, time and time again that black people are not poor, just broke. So you can kind of pick it up from there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As I said, our money goes in one direction away from us. You know, one point two trillion. That, that's huge. And but we misspend so much of our money. A lot of our money is locked into a system that cannot be recycled back into our own community. But then there is a huge percentage of our money that is discretionary, that we can support black businesses, that we can um, uh, 
invest in upgrading, if you will, our financial literacy. We are a financially illiterate people. As evidence in how we spend our money and, and, and the things that we don't invest in versus the things that we do invest in. We are so material about too many things. But to properly insure ourselves and to properly invest and manage our money and to invest in real estate instead of investing in fancy cars, um, you, you know, it, it, it just doesn't make sense. Now, it will take time to get us to move beyond the psychological necessity of buying the best and brightest stuff to drape our bodies um, and to drive the biggest and fanciest cars so that we can assuage the pain of oppression and say to the world in this very super, superficial way that I am somebody. Yes, I have a Louis Vuitton. I wear red bottom heels, right? I, I live in the fanciest neighborhoods. Um, so it, it will take us time to, to, to get and to move beyond that. And um, but that's going to take a constant diet from good and righteous thinking black people in training us how to properly invest our money, uh, uh, and, and, and where to properly invest our money, um, because we do have discretionary income that we can, and to support our own businesses and to build those businesses. One of the things that we work on at the Power Networking Conference is we have two goals. And we, the, co the conference is 15 years old, and we work on two things. And we'll be working on these two things until I'm gone and pass the baton on to the next generation that will do the conference. It will take us 100 years to achieve these two things. What are the two things? To help black people build wealth that can be transferred intergenerationally, right? Intergenerationally. We cannot allow succeeding generations to come up poorer than us, right? So that's one goal. That will take about 100 years. It'll take about three to five generations to work on the consciousness, to work on the mindset, to work on the psychology necessary for us to grasp why it's so important to think about and to treat our precious financial resources in a different kind of way. So we work on that. We train on that. We, we provide all kinds of options and all kinds of insight. The second goal is to help black people um, – uh, build businesses that will ultimately help us become the number one employer of black people. That we must become ultimately the number one employer of our own people. Why? Because that's the only way to raise up the poor. We must create work and jobs for our people. Jews are the number one employer of Jews. Asians are the number one employer of Asians. East Indians are the number one employer of East Indians. Arabs are the number one employer of Arabs. We too must ultimately build businesses that employ our own people. And that will take three to five generations. That will take about 100 years to achieve. Wow, that's We're a long time. We're one generation. <laughs> I know it's a, it's a long time, but, but think about this deeply, Lisa. I don't know of anything of significance that black folks have ever achieved that didn't take at least 100 years. Our freedom took 250 years from 1619 to 1864. The Emancipation Proclamation was an executive order. It was signed in 1865, and we were free. That took 250 years. And then from 1864 to 1964, that's 100 years, we achieved civil rights, voting rights, and public access. So great things take time. So you must... You must invest, you must persist, you must insist, you must stay the course, you must transfer this goal, these goals and objectives to succeeding generations. They pick up where you left off, and, and eventually, over time, things change. Now, I hope that we can get it done in half that time. Yeah, me too. But I've I been working on this, uh, you know, uh, aggressively for 30 years, right. and I've seen incremental change. Okay. So, I want to take a call. If you, if we can, mm -hmm. sure. Um, Michael's calling us from Portsmouth. Michael, go ahead with your call. Uh, yes, um, I, I like your uh, guest on the show. Uh, I like to say that uh, when I get in conversations about what I'm gonna do if I win lottery, 
the lotto, the first thing I said, I always wanted to own a business. Mm-hmm. When I get mm-hmm. into conversations with other people, they said, what? I'm not going to hit a lick out of black snake. And you see, that mentality right there keeps you broke. It keeps you broke emotionally. It keeps you broke mentally because you're not willing to grow further as your own existence if you're under the age of 70. And I don't understand that. Why would I want to just lay up and fish every day, which I like fishing? But there's so much to do if you got the money. Mm-hmm. There's so much to accomplish. Why there's a, 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 I used to be a, a saxophonist years ago. Well, one of the things I would like to do if I come into money is to help go to my old high school and help the first and second chair saxophonists if they're going mm-hmm. to college. Mm-hmm. Mhm. Mhm. All right. Yeah. Okay. Well, well thank you, Michael. That, that's a, <laughs> thank you, Michael. Um, Michael, uh, you know, I witness that kind of conversation, uh, you know, every day of my life. You know, right now I'm in Dallas, Texas, getting ready to speak uh, uh, tomorrow uh, at a big uh, uh, entrepreneurial conference for African Americans, and um, that's uh, what you're referring to. Is, is what I was talking about earlier, and this is the lack of consciousness. We do not have the kind of consciousness that says that if I won a billion dollars, and I mean, and everybody has fantasized about that. I mean, I've fantasized about it. I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I'm fairly well off because I've earned it over time, but, but if I won a billion dollars, what would I do? The first thing I would do is, is, is do everything I can to continue to expand my business and employ more black people. That's, that's, that's the first thing I would do. That would be because that's my consciousness, right? The other thing I would do is expand the charter schools that I've started, two charter schools, right, 300 kids, of uh, which 70% are black boys. Those, most of those kids are the dropout from the Cleveland public school system. We take the dropouts and we send them to college because we know how to teach our children. We, we know how they want to learn and how they need to learn. So, yeah, but that's consciousness. I have a different kind of consciousness, and and you have a different kind of consciousness. And so <clears throat> you're going to run into those um, who absolutely would disagree with you, as you pointed out. And so you, uh, let me just give you a little piece of advice. If you have somebody like that in your life that is about nothing, um, does not want to work hard, does not want to do for its own people, I think you need to bless and release that person. You don't need that person in your life. Okay? Now, let me give your audience some other advice. Um, <clears throat> for those of you listening, here's a litmus test of where you're going. If you can possibly find out the worth, the net worth of your five closest friends. If your five closest friends aggregately together do not have a net worth of $500,000, I'm talking about your five closest friends together, do not have a net worth of $500,000, you have some very serious work to do, right? Because even a house today, even a house today, a cheap house, right? Is more than a hundred thousand dollars. So, so you you, you know you, you, your 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 net worth will determine your net worth. And so, if the people around you are not doing the right things by their money, which is related to their consciousness and how they think about their money and how they think about their future, then you're going to have to get new friends. Wow. That is Introduce me to your five closest friends, and that will tell me who you are. Gotcha. That will tell me who you are. If you want to earn $60,000 a year, I'm sorry, if you want to earn $100,000 a year, but right now you're earning sixty, take an inventory of your five closest friends, and I will bet you that the average income from your five closest friends is about what you're earning. So if your desire is to earn 100 or 200 or 300, then you're going to have to bless and release some of your friends and and hang out with people who are earning that. You know, a lot of people are going to have a hard time. (laughs) A lot of people are going to have a hard time doing that, Dr. Frazier, releasing their friends. uh, Oh, yeah, of course. 
I, I did, I, if it was easy, why would God need you? No, this is not easy. This is very, very difficult. In fact, it's the reason why many people don't get where they want to go. They are encircled by the wrong people. They have the wrong friends. There's a major Harvard study, a 71-year continuous Harvard study that was presented on TED Talks. And brothers and sisters, if you're not watching TED Talks, you need to watch TED Talks. And um, it was they did a 71-year continuous study, and later, earlier this year, it was this month, actually, um, they made a major presentation on the finding at, on TED Talk. And they said at the end of the day, after studying 71 years and hundreds and hundreds of people and looking at their life throughout every passage of their life, that the bottom line, the bottom line, uh, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to remember how they characterize it, the bottom line reason uh, um, that, that each person achieved whatever it is that they achieved in life, the thing that was most effective and the thing that was most impactful and most influ influential were their relationships. Not their education, their relationships. Their relationships. Okay. Let's so your relationships are everything. Let me say that again, right? You thought education was important. Oh, yeah, don't get it twisted. Education is profoundly important, but it is not enough, right? Your EQ, your emotional intelligence, will be more important than your IQ, right? Your IQ. In other words, your friends and associates will ultimately determine your life, beginning with your significant other. Now, screw that up three or four times and see what your life looks like. Okay. So it begins with your significant other and then your close personal friends. Okay. Let's take another call. Clyde joins us from Hampton. Clyde, go ahead. Uh, I'd like to say that I appreciate uh, all that I've heard Dr. Frazier uh, say. Uh, if I didn't know better, I would think that he and I are brothers from a different <laughs> We <moment>. probably are. <laughs> well, that's right. <laughs> um, we're the same age. Uh, the way we started off was very similar. Uh, I was a sharecropper's son in North Carolina and raised in Nebraska. And from there hmm. on through, uh, I did what I was a carpenter, uh, woodworking. Same kind of a mm -hmm. thing that I think you said wow. you were. But, uh, wow, that's right. But I, I mopped floors at A&P food store for my first <laughs> public job. Uh, I'd just like to say that what you have said has made so much sense to people who will listen. Uh, I've tried to uh, try to tell my son that over time, and uh, it just didn't work. Uh, it, 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 you have to have a, an ability to uh, choose good habits, just like you said. That, that's uh, right. People to support you and be obedient right. to those things and to succeed. Right. Uh, I dropped out of school when I was in the ninth grade because I had failed two grades before that. Uh, I joined the Army. Things like that don't hold you back. They don't make you who you are. They don't determine who you are. They make you better if you learn from them. And I'd just like to say that's that uh, I wish you were running for president. You'd have my vote. Uh, God bless you. Thank you, friend. Clyde. <laughs> thank you for that call. That's the, that's the ultimate compliment. If I could be just a quarter of uh, our president, Barack Hussein Obama, who I just think is awesome, uh, I, I would I, I, I would be a better man. So thank you. That's, that's a very high compliment. I appreciate you for that. Dr. Frazier, I have another question for you. You have a formula for turning this bad economic situation around you i remember you mentioning learn to earn and return can you break that down for right. us sure 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 um i believe at the end of the day in the gospel of consciousness obedience and discipline which will ultimately enable all of us each of us to learn to earn and return right so yes life starts off with learning formal and informal education um, as much as you can cram into your mind and then deeply commit yourself to lifelong learning, constant never-ending improvement, personal growth and development, right? So you've got to learn 
and the old saying goes, if you want to earn more, you have to learn more. And that is the gospel truth. I started off the conversation by talking about that. So we have to learn everything we can, wherever we can, any job that we have. Uh, you know, God is constantly talking to us, telling us exactly what to do. But most people choose not to listen. Why? Because he is telling us to change, right? So if you had this job, that perhaps that uh, you, you got because you wanted to earn some money, and, you, and, and, and it's a menial job, but there's something that you can learn from it. You learn from it. You get bored with it. God is whispering in your ears. You've learned everything you can from this job. It's time to uh, take a risk and uh, move on to uh, something uh, that you can learn something new. So you can learn from every job. I learned from my days of mopping floors and stacking cans in supermarkets, right? And then, but I didn't say that. I mean, I knew I wasn't going to be, do, be doing it the rest of my life, but there were things that I could learn. And I learned from every single experience, good, bad, and ugly. And, and, and I deeply believe what, what uh, James Baldwin said so beautifully. He said, we are born, we suffer, and then we die, right? So what did James Baldwin mean by that? He means that we will all suffer. We will all fail. We will all go through hills and valleys. And, 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 and this is just life. Jesus was crucified. He was the Son of God. So, yes, we will all suffer. But your life will be determined by, this is what James Baldwin meant, how you manage your suffering and failure. When you're knocked down, do you get back up? When you're in terrible situations and untenable situations and negative situations, can you find a way to weasel your way out and work your way out of it and move on to the next thing? This is a mindset. So we must learn, right? Um, we must negotiate the valleys before we find Mount Everest, right? Um, and then once we learn... We continue to build our capacity to earn, and that capacity actually never ends, right? This is learning never ends. Now, the part that's missing from my perspective of serving our community for 40 years is that we're not returning. There are many of us who are learning, many of us who are earning, but far fewer of us are returning. And that's the piece that we have to get back to. We have to, we have to come back to our communities, and we have to save these children, and we have to invest in these children. We have to sit in these schools and sit on a desk and talk to these children because they don't see us anymore. We have left these communities. We're not returning. We know what these kids see. They see the same things that we see. So we invest your time, talent, and treasure back into your own community, into your own people, for their upliftment and up mobility is a moral and spiritual responsibility, but that's a consciousness. That's a consciousness. Okay. And we have to get back to that kind of consciousness. And it's not that that kind of consciousness never, never existed. It existed for literally hundreds of years in the context of our community. So that's that's how I see it. If you want it to simplify and, 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 and narrow it down to its essence, it's everything I talk about and have written about for 40 years, it is the gospel of consciousness, obedience, and discipline that will lead to learning, earning, and ultimately returning. When we return back, when we reach down and lift up and reach back and pull forward, and we save others because we've been saved, the condition of our community will change. It will not change. As I said earlier, we have everything we need to succeed except each other. So until we learn how to, A, love ourselves, love our history, know our history, understand that we're awesome people. We're God's first people. And that's not hype. That's science. The first, the first human remains are found in the old of gorge in Ethiopia. If you're hanging out in Ethiopia, you're blue black, right? And if God created man in his image and the first people that he created was blue black, please, 
we are an awesome and powerful people. And when you understand that, you understand that no one is ever attacked unless they are feared. I want to get so in the some... The isms of America is out of fear. Okay. Why? What do they fear? We are awesome people, but we don't understand it. We have forgotten it. I got you. I want to get in some calls because the phone lines are lit up, and uh, and we only have actually about six minutes left in this conversation. I can't believe how fast the time has gone. Anita's on the line um, from Chesapeake. Anita, go ahead with your question or comment. I want to thank you very, very much for this uh, conversation that you're having today and just bless this man for sharing his wisdom and knowledge. Wow. My grandmother had a saying for this. It was, by your company, you are known. And to me, that's that covers every aspect of your life. You have to be around people yes. that's encouraging and, and uplifting, and you have to remember where you come from and share backwards, always share backwards. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Right. No question about that. Um, we are the children. I just want to say this. I know we only have a couple of minutes, but we, please, brothers and sisters listening, remember that we are the children of the slaves that would not die that we have the genetic encoding of the great kings and queens of Africa. We are of the genetic stock of the world's first great mathematicians, engineers, and scientists, that we were building pyramids and solving complex engineering problems when other cultures were living in huts, eating each other. And if everything happens for a reason and serves us in some special way, and we will never understand the reason looking forward, we will only understand it looking backward. If that is true, maybe we were not brought here. Maybe we were sent here. Do you believe that God would put his weakest people here to do his toughest job? I don't think so. How could an America who could morally, spiritually, and biblically justify the kidnapping, raping, and pillaging of another two people, natives already in America, and Africans brought to America, have any moral or spiritual grounding? And perhaps had God not sent us here, America might have self-destructed by now. We are powerful people, and we must show that. We must demonstrate that to the world. We have it like that. Okay, let's let's try to. Whenever the rules are clear, whenever the rules are clear and the playing field is level, Lisa. Not only can we compete, we will dominate. We will change the game on you. We have it like that, and we must remember that. All righty, let's try to get in one more call. Mike joins us now from Virginia Beach. Mike, you have a quick question. We have about three minutes left. Yeah, quick question. Uh, I, I too uh, am enjoying the conversation. I agree with pretty much everything Dr. Frazier is saying. But my question is, generationally, looking at young people these days and what they're dealing with, mostly in the inner city and places like major cities like Chicago and places like that, how, I mean, they're not listening to PBS. So how, do, how does your message get down to the grassroots of black America, the people that really need to hear what you're saying about how to go about changing their lives and their level of consciousness? To, uh, to change their situation? How, how do you reach that, that group? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. And, you know, I'm one. There are many more like me. I'm not the only one. There are many more like me. So I've committed my life to, to crisscrossing this country, uh, speaking 150 times a year, doing 200 radio programs like this great radio program, writing books, Uh, and practicing what I preach, teach, and evangelize, you see, because that's what we, we, our our people, our people are people of witnessing, and they want to not only hear these kinds of messages, but they want you to be a witness by actually doing things, not just writing about them and speaking about them, but actually doing what you're talking about. You know, uh, what my daddy taught me many years ago, what you do, speak so loudly, I can't hear what you say. So every brother and sister that's doing something has a role in this. It's not just me. You may not be able to do it at the level at which I'm able to do it at this point in time, but if you, if you chart the path, stay the course, you will be. And over time, over time, you will infect your immediate circle with your ideas and with your modeling, and over time, things will change. Okay, Mike, did that help? one must reach one and teach one. Mike, did that help? Yeah, and I really appreciate the, the conversation. It is certainly something that's not being had uh, on a more regular basis. Uh, and this program is just great. Thank, thanks a lot. Thanks for calling in, Mike. 
Dr. Frazier, we have like less than two minutes, and I really <laughs> hate to let you go. But could you leave us with a with a single thought? I really wanted to ask you about the the one the biggest mistake that people make when networking. But we only have a minute and a half, so could you share? <laughs> um, well, I'm going to just do it in, in, in less than a minute. The biggest mistake that we make when networking, especially people of African descent, is we network to get something. We see, you see, we most of us are networking to get wrong. You network to give. And as you give, you get. If you ain't giving, you ain't getting. If you have nothing, it's because you've given nothing. That you cannot take out of life that which you have not put into life, just as you cannot take out of the bank that which you have not put into the bank. Right? So most of us are networking the wrong way. Right. They, they network. You, you go out and you network with somebody. And the first question you ask is, what can you do for me? I mean, you, you, we say it in different ways, but that's the essence of the question. That's the wrong question when you're networking with people. The right question is trying to understand what they are trying to do. And then asking them, how can I help you? How can I serve you? I, see, I'm in a contest with everybody I meet. They never know what the contest is. And I believe that the first person that gives wins. So if you're in a 10-minute conversation with me and I'm just meeting you, you're going to find that nine minutes of conversation is going to be about you. One minute will be about me. What I'm trying to do is figure out who you are, what you need. What, and, and, and I'm going through my mental Rolodex, an inventory of things that I have access, and I'm trying to look for something that I have that I can give you right then and there. Right then and there. And if I can do that, I win. And we are out of time. (laughs) And we are out of time. (laughs) Dr. George Frazier, thank you so much for being a part of today's Another View broadcast. If you'd like to hear this show again, please visit our website at anotherviewradio.org or download the podcast. Our theme music was composed and performed by Jay Sinnott. And I'd like to thank Danny Epperson, who so graciously filled in for me. Victor Bowen is our audio engineer. And Melanie Booth answered our phones. Next Friday, another gear gears up for another race. Let's talk about it. Town Hall. Barbara will be back here in the big chair and with another view on politics co-host Eric Claville. Have a wonderful weekend, everyone. Stay warm, be safe, and we'll see you next Friday when we get together again for another view.